We're all seeking something in our daily lives. Relief in a high-stress world. Rest in a fast-paced society. Hope in a discouraging culture. But there's only one place to go for what you need most, to Jesus. Kick off 2025 by seeking Jesus every day with the brand new Time of Grace devotional, Daily Promises. This easy to use 365 day devotional invites you to look to God in the year ahead to meet your every need and strengthen you for all that life brings. I actually wasn't planning on talking to you today about money. But I'm super glad that I am, and in a few minutes, I think you're going to be super glad that I am too. <laughs> um, you see, uh, we're kicking off a series on the promises of God today. And as I was thinking about the promises that God makes to his people, I, I thought about one of my all-time favorite promises, God's presence. That wherever a Christian is, our Heavenly Father is right by our side. And he doesn't show up with half of himself or 10% of himself, but with all of his glory, his power, his wisdom, his compassion, his justice, his forgiveness. If you're a follower of Jesus, there's no singular place on the planet that you could be where God is not by your side. I was so excited to preach about that promise that I opened my Bible to one of the best passages to prove that promise. Hebrews 13, verse 5, second half of the verse says this, because God has said, never will I leave you and never will I forsake you. And I was super jacked up as a pastor to spend 30 minutes talking about that. But then this thought hit me. If I'm going to preach on the second half of a verse, it's probably biblically responsible that I also read the, the first half of the verse. And that's when I discovered that this verse is not just about the presence of God. This verse is primarily about money. Let me prove it to you. The whole verse says this. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you and never will I forsake you. Now, God must have a, a funny sense of humor because the day that I sat down to study this verse, not knowing its context was about financial means, my heart was not quite right and money was the problem. <laughs> I'm not making this up just to be more dramatic as a preacher. Literally, the, the day that I sit down and open my computer to start typing notes, uh, my life was financially like this. Um, you see, it's been an interesting financial year for my family. My wife stepped back from her full-time salary job just to have a little bit more work-life balance, um, which is great. But it means that her income was chopped by about 60% as now she works an hourly part-time job. And we were prepared for that. There's some other stuff going on in our family that, you know, we were getting by. I was tracking the budget. But what I wasn't planning on was my mechanic who called me and said, quote, Mike, your car is old. <laughs> End of quote. <laughs> He's like, we need to fix the transmission line. It's going to cost you X and the brakes are this close to going, did you plan on driving this car on the highway was a question he literally asked me. <laughs> and so, you know, we add up X and Y and Z, and then he says, honestly, even if we do all this, even if you pay all this, I can't guarantee how long it's going to run. And, and that would have been bad enough, except this wasn't the really old car that I drive that some of you have seen, Tina, my town and country, with 255,000 miles on it. And, and then I started thinking, oh my goodness, if Tina dies, which she could any day, literally, and this other car dies, have any of you seen how much it costs to buy a used car these days? It's like insane. So I'm looking at my bank account thinking, I, I can maybe cover one, but I'm not sure if I can cover two. And of course, this is the exact same week where my wife texts me and says, hey, just got back from the dentist. Um, wisdom, uh, Brooklyn needs her wisdom teeth taken out. Our dentist, by the way, is the guy who's playing guitar today in worship, uh, Blake. So I thought, and Dr. Blake is going to cover it? <laughs> nope. <laughs> Insurance is going to cover it? Uh, so, some of it, she said. And then I get the bill, $2,000 more after insurance. And, uh, so so I, go to, I go to church. I sit down to try to study 
week one of this sermon series and the car or cars are on my mind and the wisdom teeth bill is on my mind and the paychecks are on my mind and the banking statement is on my mind. And, and I sit down to, you know, divert a little bit and get ready for the sermon. And who would have thought, who would have thought that my heavenly father wanted to have a word with my heart about his promises? I was so glad that God wanted to talk to me that day about money. And I wonder if some of you are in that same boat. Yeah, I've kind of noticed this, that it doesn't matter if you live in America or Africa. It doesn't matter if you're a part-time employee or you're the boss who's cutting the paychecks. It doesn't matter if you're a teenager trying to save up for your cell phone bill or college tuition or you're a retiree looking at your portfolio, stocks, the inflation, and the market. It, it, you can't escape this situation where it's so easy to worry about wealth. I mean, most of us live in the most prosperous culture in all of human history, but that doesn't mean that we have somehow moved past the fear of not having enough. Does this happen to you? And yeah, maybe you're working a part-time job making 15 bucks an hour, trying to be the first person in your family to go to college. And then you look at the tuition that it costs to go to college, not 15 bucks, but 15,000 a year, if you're lucky, a semester more likely. Or maybe you've met someone, you're ready to settle down, and you're looking how much it costs to buy a ring or to plan, what is the average wedding in America right now? About $30,000. You want to put down a down payment on a house and the, the market is nuts and you, you can't even get an inspection and you better outbid the 17 other offers. And maybe you're on a fixed income and that thing comes from the government in the mail that says, we're adjusting your benefits. Maybe you look at the national debt in America and start to think about inflation and your future or your children or your children's children. Maybe you make the mistake like I have to go to one of those websites of how much you should have invested by your age. It's probably smart, but just don't do it. <laughs> it doesn't matter if you're investing. You're always, you're always behind. Or maybe you just made some bad choices with money. You spend as soon as it hits your pocket and, and you're not prepared for when the car repair hits or the wisdom teeth need to come out. Or there's a medical bill you didn't anticipate paying or a divorce that you, you didn't want, but now there's child support payments. You know, 15,000 different things can happen that just, just leaves us in this like low-level anxiety. Will I have enough? Am I going to be okay? What's tomorrow going to look like? And I would propose to you that that is why, in context, I am so glad, I think we are so glad that our Heavenly Father wants to talk to us today about money. Now, today's not one of those church sermons where the, the pastor says, God wants us to be generous and then we pass the basket twice so you can, you can give more. Um, There's a time and a place for financial generosity. That's part of being a Christian. But, but today is not what you're giving. Uh, instead, it's what you're getting. Uh, a promise that God gives to all of his children no matter how rich or how broke you might be a promise that can move you from the place where I was, this low-level panic, uh, to a place where I'm, I'm getting closer to a peace in God's promises. So today I want to share with you this beautiful passage from Hebrews chapter 13, but in context, what your Heavenly Father has to say to save you from the fear and get you back to a promise-based faith. So if you're ready for that, grab a Bible or just follow along on the screen. We're in Hebrews 13 today. And we begin with these words. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. So God wants to talk to us about the love of money. It's really important that we note that phrase. Um, some people think that the Bible is against money, like money is the root of all kinds of evil. That's actually a misquote of a Bible passage in 1 Timothy chapter 6. God is not against people who have money. He's not against people who have lots of money. There were people in the Bible who were very faithful and very rich. You don't have to take a vow of poverty to follow Jesus. Having money, making money, trying to make more money, investing money, saving money, spending money, none of these things are a problem with your Heavenly Father. What, what is a problem? What he wants to save us from is, quote, the love of money. 
He says emphatically, keep your lives free from it. Like be the opposite of that. God hates the love of money. The Bible says if you love money, it will lead you astray and pierce your spirit, your very soul, with many griefs. So maybe you're wondering, well, what exactly does that mean? What does it mean to love money? How do I know if I love money? If you're taking notes, here's my simple definition of the love of money. The love of money is when money means more to you than God. It's not having money or having God. The question is, when push comes to shove, which one do you love more? Which one do you trust in more? Which one do you fear losing more? Which one are you most excited about? The Bible is very concerned uh, about your heart, which guides your hands and dictates what you do with the money that God puts in it. Um, For example, uh, let's imagine it's your birthday and you get two birthday cards from your two grandmas. Grammar number one uh, gives you a stock card she bought from Hallmark, just signs her name, happy birthday on the bottom, happy birthday exclamation point, but inside that very plain card is a check. Mm. You flip the check over, 100 bucks, happy birthday, it says in the subject line, love grandma. Grammar number two sends you a card. You open the envelope, like most 12-year-olds, you open it and shake it, see if anything comes out. Nothing comes out. So you look inside, there's no money, there are no gift cards, but what grandma has done is filled this card on both sides with prayers and promises from God. Grandma number one has given you more money. Grandma number two has given you more faith. Which grandma are you most grateful for? (laughs) Uh, You grab your Bible. At the same time, you open your banking app. This one tells you you're in trouble. The other one tells you you are not. Do you feel like you're in trouble? (laughs) Which do you trust in? (laughs) The boss offers you an opportunity to make good money, but you know it's going to cost you this. The overtime, the time and a half, the job, the career, you will start to lose the connection you have with the people of God and the word of God. You could have more money, or you could have more of God's will for your life. Which one excites you? Or what if there's a line that you could cross to make just a little bit more? Or getting paid in cash so we can keep the government out of it. I'm leaving out a detail or two on your W-2 so you stay in the right tax bracket. There are things that we can do that are not totally honest, but they're financially beneficial. Uh, what do you do? Uh, when I got my first job, uh, back when I was 15 and a half, I worked in lawn care. And at the business that I worked for, we always had to punch in when we got to work, and then we had to punch out for lunch, and then we had to punch in after lunch, and then we had to um, punch out once again when we left for the day. But, but I quickly learned that the punch clock would round to the nearest 15 minutes. Which meant that if I showed up at 7.07, it clocked me like I showed up at 7. And if I took lunch at 11.53, it'd round up like I was working till noon. And if I came back at 12.37, it would round seven minutes back like I had started working at 12.30. And if I left at 2.53, it acted like I worked until three. By the way, this was my dad's business that I was working for. <laughs> 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 it dawned on me. I've never told him this story, so he's going to be in the later service. We're going to see how that goes for me, right? There was a way. It was not the most ethical or honest way that I could make more money. So when God says, treat others as you would want to be treated, <laughs> but there's another way to get a little bit more. What, what do we do? Man, it's tempting. Even in a culture like this, with prosperity like this, it is always so tempting to want more, to have more, to spend more, to believe it's, it's not enough, that we need more. It, it's so tempting that we sometimes will compromise our spiritual lives, our honesty, our ethics. And, and God, who loves us so deeply, he, he just says so bluntly, no, keep your lives free from that. Be content with what you have in this moment. Godliness 
plus contentment, the Bible says, is great gain. And so God wants us to flee from the love of money, to fight against the love of money, to trust a better way to live, because here it is. Now we see all of verse 5 from Hebrews 13. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because, here's why you can do that, because God has said, never will I leave you and never will I forsake you. Man, this verse is so epic. If you're looking for your next Bible tattoo, at least that second half, God, like the God of love and power, the God of forgiveness and grace, this God has said, Never will I leave you and never will I forsake you. Right? Notice the repetition of the verse. He could say it once and that would be enough. But he knows how fearful our hearts can be, so he says it twice. Then he chooses really strong verbs like leave and forsake. Then he adds the emphatic, never will I let that happen. Never will I do that to you. And in fact, if you spoke Greek, like the book of Hebrews was originally written in, you would find out, that the intensity of this promise is turned up about five notches. Most of you, if you want to turn off your brain right now, you can take about a 30-second break. But for those of you who are word nerds like me, um, in the Greek language, this is called, by grammar experts, a strong future negation. John, you remember this when we were studying Greek back in college? There's little words that you can put together in Greek that basically don't just say never, but never, ever, 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 ever will I do that. It's the strongest way the Greeks could express that something will never happen in the future. God used it once, never will I leave you, and then he used again the same form, never will I forsake you. God is saying, no matter what happens to you financially, no matter how much you have or don't, I will never, ever, 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 ever not be by your side. That is the promise that our Heavenly Father makes to every single Christian. And so God is saying, you don't need to be afraid. In fact, look at verse 6. Here's the conclusion. If you believe that strong promise from God, we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? Isn't that such a, a boss promise? What can, you have to say it like you're in the Lord of the Rings. What can mere mortals do to me? <laughs> like, if, if you love money... The answer is a whole lot. Like the government could spend too much and then inflation would go up and then our currency would be cut in half. If, if I need more stuff, someone could take it. Someone could borrow it and forget to return it. Like there's a million things that can happen that will totally make you panic and freak out. But if your hope is not in the promises that money makes, but instead the promises that God makes, we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper I will not be afraid. My God has said, never will I leave you and never will I forsake you. Listen, if you, if you want to sleep well at night and wake up with less fear, the answer is not giving you 50K. The answer is giving you a firmer trust in the promises that God has already made to you. You don't have to work extra hours you don't have to somehow escape your past credit score. Like what you need to live with peace is not out of reach. It's simple trust that the God who made this promise has to keep it because he's God. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I believe that and I will not be afraid. Um, let me compare um, this word to this wallet. My wife lent me this uh, old wallet of hers. I put inside $4. That's all the cash I had in my house. <laughs> Did you know that your wallet wants to talk to you? I'm not sure how money talks. I wasn't sure how to do the impression of money today, but we're going to give it my, my best shot. You know, your, your wallet, and you actually put words in your wallet's mouth, says, you don't have enough of me. You, you need more of me. You should, did you see what's going on? What if this happens? What if that happens? What if they cut back your hours? What if inflation goes up? Like money is talking, talking, talking. If you had more of me, you'd be happy. If you just had a little bit more, you'd be content. Money preaches. But come on, it does not keep its promises. Right? Some of you are old enough like me to know this. When, when you're young, you think, oh, if, if I could just make five figures, if I could just make 
15,000. If I could just make 25,000. And then, as you get older, maybe that happens to you. Do the fears disappear? Nah, because money only has one sermon. You need more. Doesn't bless you. Doesn't save you. Just get used to a new level of prosperity and your heart ends up in the exact same place it was before. Ah, but, but this. <laughs> when the Bible starts talking to you about God, about where he is, about who he is, about his love, promises like, never, ever, ever will I leave you. The Lord is my helper. Why would I be afraid? God is not just here. He's here to help you. And if you listen to that, in fact, if you plant that promise deep in your heart, you don't have to panic like people who are twice as rich as you. You can have the kind of peace that the Apostle Paul discovered. If, if God gives me everything or nothing, if I'm in a palace or a prison cell, my heart's good because I know who is by my side and I know how that God feels about me. If you take notes, here's the first big promise I want to plant into your heart is that God is here. And according to the words of this text, he's not just here, but he's here to help. God, in our relationship with him, is not some distant friend or some VIP celebrity. God is constantly present with his people. You, you can't always see him. But he said, as emphatically as he can in his word, I will never, ever, ever leave you alone. Jesus promised, surely I will be with you always. And that's why none of you need more. That's why you can be content. That's why you can live without fear. And hopefully pastors like me can help you with that. Verse 7 is interesting in this context. It says, Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. There's three commands there for you and there's one big encouragement for me. You know, it says you should remember your leaders who spoke the word to you, so don't forget about your pastors. Remember them. Second, consider, like really sit down and think about the outcome of their way of life. Okay, this is how they choose to live and this is the result of it. And then, if it's a good result, you should finally imitate their faith. You know, pastors have a lot of jobs, but apparently one of our jobs that I'm going to try to do a better job at is reminding you that you don't need more to live with peace and joy. You don't need more clothes to be happy. You don't need more toys this Christmas to be content. Oh, some of the kids are so mad right now. Like, don't sabotage my Christmas pastor. Like, tell me. <laughs> you don't need a nicer car or a bigger home. Those things are fine. They're not sinful. You can have them. But please, please, please do not believe that somehow this toy is going to do what the last one did not. Don't think that this sweater, this new pair of shoes, this, no, no. I want you to live with a kind of contentment. I want to model that the best I can. I want to try to prove to you, it's not just because I'm lazy, although that's part of it, that you could wear the same clothes like every day for years and still be happy. That's possible. And you can drive a car with 255,000 miles on it. The air conditioning doesn't work. And you can sweat with Jesus and enjoy life. Like you, you don't need the stuff. I'm not judging you if you got the stuff. Your house might be bigger or smaller than mine. Your car might be older or newer. Some guy was, <laughs> he was talking big after the first service. He says, 255,000, Pastor. I got 332. So, <laughs> right? The point is, if we can consider the outcome of the way of life of fellow Christians, to just look at them and say, wow, I, I think they have a good life and it's not because they got a lot of good stuff. They've discovered, as the New Testament says, the secret of being content, which isn't a bigger salary, it's a bigger faith, in the promises of God. And friends, our last verse for today reminds us that those promises are all ours. Verse 8. It says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. What pastors like me, what all of God's people like you are, are trying to remind ourselves is that Jesus does not change that's what allows us to live with confidence and say, because of Jesus, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. Because of Jesus, God will keep this promise. Never, ever, ever will I leave you. And never, ever, ever 
Will I forsake you? You know, think 2,000 years ago, um, how Jesus was. I mean, he met people who were all messed up when it came to money. I think of Matthew, the tax collector, just greedy, selling out his honesty just to put more in his pocket. Um, Did Jesus walk up to him and say, get out of here, man? No, he, he stopped. He looked the man in the eye and he said, you too, follow me. And so Matthew did. He, he threw a party and all his greedy, money-loving, tax-collecting friends came and Jesus didn't bounce because the, the party was morally beneath his standards. Instead, he stayed and he showed love and he offered forgiveness. And, and this passage tells us that Jesus has not changed. He doesn't see people with tons of credit card debts who were working hours on Sundays and neglecting their own soul. He doesn't say, get out of here. Instead, he invites us And he forgives us, and he helps us, and he saves us. He hasn't changed. He he loved surprising people 2,000 years ago, and he loves surprising people today. He loves you, and he loves me. He forgave people of their sins back then, and he hasn't changed. That's why he forgives them even now today. And this is what I want you to believe. This is what I'm reminding my own heart, that God has made a promise through his son, Jesus Christ, to forgive us of our greed to erase our love of money, to make us rich in spiritual and eternal matters. And here's the richest promise of all, that God is right here. Ooh, that's why I have a free gift for you today. Maybe some of these in your program when you came in. Could you grab it, take it out for a second? Uh, This little postcard, uh, we printed one for each of you, is the homework to help your heart. On the back of this postcard are the five big ideas, the five promises that we're going to study in this sermon series with a simple Bible passage that guides each one. And your job before this series is over is to memorize all five of these promises. There will be pop quizzes. You have been warned. Come prepared. <laughs> Some of you can't handle getting like a B, so you're going to study like crazy. So I'm hoping to motivate you by that. You know, I want you to you know, curl this up in the cup holder of your car. And as you're driving to work, just to repeat This promise, God is here. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. Hebrews 13, verse 5. Or when you're shaving or doing your hair or makeup in the morning to just stick this by the mirror and recite the promises of God. I want you to bury the trustworthy promises of God deep within your soul so when that moment comes, when your mechanic says, we need to talk, and your wife texts you, ooh, the wisdom teeth, (laughs) and you open your banking app and say, ooh, In those moments, your heart will respond. It will push back on the panic and say, it's going to be okay. I'm going to be okay. Because of the sacrifice of Jesus, the God who wants what's best for me is not far away. He's right here and he's here to help. There's an old legend that says there's a certain initiation rite by which a Cherokee Indian boy becomes a man. His father leads him out far from the village through the woods where they have hunted um, you know, beasts of, of prey together. And he finds a clearing in the woods with a, a simple stump. And the father makes his son sit down. He looks him in the eye and he says, Son, if you can sit right here and not get up, if you don't move until the sun comes up, if you can make it in this spot through the night, you will officially have become one of us, a man. But before he leaves, the father takes a blindfold, wraps it around the son's eyes, ties it off. The boy takes a deep breath as he hears the crunch of his father's footsteps walking away. He sits and he waits. And at first he's so confident he's going to become a man in just a few hours until the first howl comes from the woods. (laughs) And the crunch of the leaves behind him, he remembers the size of the animals that he and his father used to hunt. And the panic starts to set in. He thinks about getting up, tearing the blindfold off to see what's hunting him. But trusting the promise of his father, he waits. And he waits and a minute passes, then an hour. An hour turns to two and then four until finally, finally, the first peak of the sunrise comes up and pierces the blindfold. And the kid, relieved, 
takes the blindfold off. He gets up and, and he looks at the edge of the woods and who does he see? His dad. The father had not left him alone to fight the things he could not see. Instead, he was right by his side, keeping the promise that he had made to his son years ago, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. And friends, the Christian life is kind of like being that kid. You can't see what's going to happen to you financially. We, we don't know what tomorrow will bring for our jobs, our careers, our cars, this nation, or the economy. What we do know is that even if we can't see him, our Heavenly Father is not way, way, way far away in heaven. He, he's just right there. In fact, he wanted you to know it so bad, he said this, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? Believe that. And you will live in peace. You will live in the promised land. Let's pray. Oh, God, thank you so much for speaking about your presence. Um, I thank you, God, that you don't just hang out with poor people who are desperate for your help, and you don't just hang out with rich people who have many advantages in this life. You promise to be with all of your people. Um, God, most of us know by experience that uh, getting more money does not make us more content. Uh, doesn't increase our joy for very long. We, we get used to wealth really fast. And so I pray that your spirit would um, help us to live out these words, to be content with what we have, to be marketed at for the millionth time, but this time not to believe those promises, to know that only Jesus can make us happy for long. Uh, please save us from the love of money. Release us and free us from its grip. It's so hard in a materialistic culture like ours. Help me as a pastor to be a good example of someone who doesn't need more um, to be content and live with joy. And Heavenly Father, in the end, help us to remember no matter what tomorrow brings, that you're going to be there. And if you're there, that's enough. We pray all these things in the beautiful name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, the one who is the same yesterday and today and forever. And all God's people said. Powerful reminder from Pastor Mike today that money isn't where we put our hope. God is always with us, whether we have a lot or a little, and that's far more valuable. It may only be November, but we want to help you get ready to kick off 2025 with our brand new 365-day devotional, Daily Promises, Devotions for Every Day. This devotional invites you to look to God in the year ahead to meet your every need and give you strength. Request your copy with your gift to Time of Grace. We're all seeking something in our daily lives. Relief in a high-stress world. Rest in a fast-paced society. Hope in a discouraging culture. But there's only one place to go for what you need most. To Jesus. Kick off 2025 by seeking Jesus every day with the brand new Time of Grace devotional, Daily Promises. This easy-to-use 365-day devotional invites you to look to God in the year ahead to meet your every need and strengthen you for all that life brings. Daily Promises is our thanks for your financial gift to help more people grow their relationships with Jesus each day. Request yours today by calling 800-661-3311, visiting timeofgrace.org, or writing us at P.O. Box 301, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, 53201. Do you ever wonder if you're saved, or what saved even means, or what God is like, or what Jesus did? Some people are embarrassed to ask these really basic questions, but please don't be. They're the most important questions you could ever ask. And that's why I want to give you a brand new copy of this little book I wrote called The Basics. Uh, you can get your paper copy or your digital copy or your audio copy or your video version just by going to timeofgrace.org slash the basics. Time of Grace doesn't end here. Visit timeofgrace.org and explore encouraging resources or sign up for our daily email and have everything delivered right to your inbox. Like our Grace Moments devotions, Grace Talks devotional videos, blog, and podcasts. Follow us on social media where you'll find a supportive Christian community. Do you need prayer? Contact us and let us know what's on your heart. Thank you so much for your support. See you next week on Time of Grace.